What is up guys? Well, it is the last week of 2022 and as usual, per tradition, it is time to start doing the year in review videos. The best of, the worst of, most disappointing, most surprising, all of that good stuff. And today we're going to be kicking it all off with the top 10 worst films of 2022 for me personally. Now before I even get started, there's been this growing trend, especially on Twitter over the past couple of years, to where there's a lot of anger, a lot of vitriol, a lot of... Uh, controversy we'll say regarding anybody that decides to write out a list or make a video of a list of the worst something of 2022 the opinion being you've already given the negative review why do you have to dredge it back up and talk about it again almost like we're celebrating these movies failing and there's certainly some creators that will do that but to my own defense i'll say that some of us are not relishing in the fact that these movies were disappointing to the point where they are the least satisfying experiences we've had all year. But in my opinion, if you're gonna discuss art, if you're gonna discuss things that you love, if we're gonna acknowledge the best and you know the crown jewels of the year, you have to acknowledge your least satisfying experiences to have that full spectrum of what worked and what didn't for work for you throughout the year. So uh, I'll do my best to be as respectful as possible, certainly not celebrating these movies being failures. So if that's not good enough, then I guess it's not good enough. Enjoy the video anyway. Now, before we kick off my top 10 of the year, I do want to give an honorable or I guess a dishonorable mention to one movie that didn't quite make my worst of the year. It's a very well made movie. It's a very well acted movie. It's effective, but it is the movie that pissed me off more than anything else I watched in this calendar year. And that is Speak No Evil. It's a movie that's kind of exploring social interaction and some of the horrors that can come along with that and some of the horrific situations that people will put themselves in just to not be portrayed as rude and that's something that certainly rings true you know people will value their social interaction with people more than all of the bells and whistles and red flags going off and so it's a movie that's effective it's certainly true with what it's exploring but by the end of it the things that uh, befell one character in particular because of the inaction of other characters just infuriated me that's my one little bugaboo about movies the one thing that happens in this movie it sets me off turns my stomach and i have to watch something to raise my spirits before i can go to bed so felt like i needed to mention that kicking it off with number 10 is going to be alex garland's men now unfortunately this is one of those movies where the conversation has been the worst part about it which you knew as soon as the title and the poster of this movie came out, that's what was going to happen. My comment section has essentially been two separate things. Either somebody comment and saying, I totally agree, I'm on your side, fuck this woke trash. And I didn't call it woke trash, so I don't know who they're agreeing with. But nonetheless, there's those, and then you have everybody who's like, oh, well, of course you didn't like this movie. It's just way above you because it's not the type of movies that you type of, you enjoy. And you look like the toxic man that should be watching this and learning from it. But, you know, look in the mirror. Fuck all of them, too. That's basically the two comments that I've gotten, the, the entire conversation surrounding this movie. And unfortunately, my issues with the film aren't really that deep in either of those pools. It's just that I didn't find the message that they were telling to be told all that creatively or all that entertaining. You know, it, it's a movie that's written and, and brought to you by a male about how toxic masculinity affects the everyday life of a woman. And so it seems like mansplaining, which is so ironic with the message this movie's trying to get across that it feels like mansplaining toxic masculinity. What? So you had the lead character that had this horrific marriage that ended in the most horrific way possible, and her husband was the worst type of guy, and then she goes off to try to have some peace, and in this little foreign village, every single guy that she meets is played by the same actor, which is a neat little visual trick, and he embodies all of the different styles of toxic masculinity and you know poor interaction with females. And so the whole movie is that for the most part. Until the last 30 minutes and then it gets ultra high concept and body horror and gory and you know real metaphoric and just the whole package, not the type of movie for me. I loved Ex Machina. I really enjoyed Annihilation until the last 10 minutes got a little bit too out there for me, but I really like Alex Garland as a filmmaker. This one just did not work for me. I wasn't offended by it. I wasn't somebody that was up in arms about social commentary. I, I'm all for that as long as you do it creatively. To me, it was just very surface value. And the message, the intended, you know, thing that you're supposed to walk away with in this film, what it's trying to teach you, it feels like it made its point in the first 10 minutes and then just kept recycling that over and over and over and over and over again to where you're like, I fucking get it. 
Number nine is going to be they slash them. And just like with men, when I watched the trailer, when I saw the title, when I saw the poster, I was like, oh, don't let it be that type of movie. Let it be more creative than what I think it's going to be. And to its credit, it's not the movie that I thought it was going to be. But unfortunately, I think the movie I thought it was going to be would have been a bit more impactful. Essentially, what you have here is a lot of varying characters from the LGBTQ community that are brought into this, you know, psychological reassignment camp where they're essentially trying to turn them all straight. And it's ran by Kevin Bacon. And then you have in the last 30 minutes and sprinkled throughout the movie, this generic as fuck slasher storyline that's thrown in that doesn't mix in whatsoever. And so you have the core storyline about these different characters at this camp that some of them are there by their own accord. Some of them are forced to be there because of the people they interact with or their family or their friends or their lovers or whatever. And there was a lot of interesting things to explore with that. I mean, especially for somebody who is straight and is not a part of that community. There's a lot of things to kind of make me let me get into somebody else's shoes and walk in their shoes for a day and show me some of the horrors that they interact with every single day that I don't even realize is there. Things that I take for granted. There's a lot of things you can do with that, that there's a horror in and of itself in that situation with that setting of this camp that could have been really effective and it just never quite got there. And then the slasher storyline is so generic. The kills suck. Nothing interesting about that. The reveal is obvious and not interesting and it doesn't mix with the other parts of the movie whatsoever. It's like two competing ideas that just they kind of lessen each other by mixing them together. And by the end of it, you have a movie that felt like it was so afraid to offend anybody that it didn't take any risks or make any statements or do anything bold. Felt like it was afraid to offend the LGBTQ community. It was afraid to offend the straight community. It was afraid to offend people that hate the LGBTQ community. It was so odd to where it's like, if you're going to make a movie like this, you need to plant your feet and take a stance somewhere. Otherwise, why the fuck are we here? And so by the end of it, it just felt pointless. It was innocent enough. It's not an offensive movie, but it feels pointless. Number eight is one that sucks that I have to include on this list because I was really championing it, but unfortunately it did land in my bottom 10 of the year and that is Rob Zombie's The Monsters. I was really hoping this was gonna be the one. I was cheering it on back when it was announced, back when they were posting the different pictures of the construction of the house. I was like, oh, please let this be it, Rob. I'm somebody that, for the most part, Rob Zombie movies don't work for me. I like some better than others, but they always let me down. There's none of them that I would say that I love. And this felt like the one that could be it. This is the one where he could change the conversation and everybody would be like united and saying, holy crap, this dude can actually make a really good, solid, crowd-pleasing movie. And whatever we got at the end was just not that. It was a movie where I watched it and I went, I don't know who this is for besides Rob Zombie. I don't think it appeals to fans of the original sitcom. I don't think it appeals to people that have never experienced that sitcom and are coming to it for the first time in this modern context of Rob Zombie's monsters. I don't think it appeals to his traditional fan base at all because it's his most kid-friendly, family-friendly movie by a landslide. I don't even think it appeals to kids and families because my family watched it and they were not that engaged with it. Yet again, the biggest thing that always lets me down with Rob Zombie movies is the writing and here yet again, the story's not all that interesting. It's not a very well-written plot and the dialogue is not that great. Some of it is trying to be throwback classic dialogue. I think that it, it fails more than it succeeds with that. And the casting, I, aside from Daniel Roebuck, who I think was awesome as grandpa, Everybody else, for the most part of the main characters, felt like they were miscast. I mean, you got Sherry Moon Zombie that's just like, it. I get sick of saying it because it feels like I'm picking on her and I hate that because she seems like a totally lovely person, but she is not a very good actress. And to consistently put her as the forefront, as the lead of your movie, it just does nothing but shine a light onto that. And it doesn't feel like she's growing as an actress, as many movies jobs that she's gotten from her husband. So she's not that great as Lily. It feels like an impersonation of an impersonation of the original Lily Munster. And then you have Jeff Daniel Phillips, who does really good on the physical side of Herman Munster, but his voice is just so wrong for that character that it just takes me out of the movie every single time that he talks. I mean, you have Fred Gwynn that is just this iconically deep and rich voice. You know, sometimes that is better. It's just so iconic with that character and it fits the Frankenstein, hulking monster character. And then you get Jeff Daniel Phillips and I'm just looking for a vision. And the story they decided to tell, it just felt like a pilot episode of the TV show, like a TV reboot, which would have made more sense being that it was direct to Netflix for whatever reason. But 
I, I just didn't get into it. You know, it's the origin of how they met. There's a couple of conflicts that get, you know, quietly resolved. And then the last 30 minutes kind of feels like this tacked on, welcome to America, here's the Mockingbird Lane house, and doesn't really lead anywhere that feels like we want or need a continuation. And so just the whole thing is just a big confusion to me about why we made this, about what he was trying to do, about who he was trying to appeal to, and about why the hell Universal gave him the budget to make this. I mean, I understand why his last couple of films have been crowdfunded because he has such a specific niche audience. That doesn't change with the monsters for as much family-friendly dialogue as he puts into it. So certainly one of the biggest disappointments of the year and absolutely one of the worst for me. Number seven is going to be The Cellar. Now this was a Shutter exclusive when I watched it. I don't know if it still is, but uh, this is a movie that I watched for one reason and one reason alone, and that is Alicia Cuthbert. This woman was at the top of my list of crushes and fantasies when I was a teenager into my early 20s. Still think she looks gorgeous by the way, but just yeah, I've always loved her and I've missed seeing her in movies. The Girl Next Door is just it's one of those movies that defines an era of my life because of her. So aside from my male pig headed motivation to click on this movie, I checked it out because it seemed like it might be an interesting play on a haunted house movie. And it's certainly unique. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's interesting. Essentially what you have here is your traditional setup for family moves into this creepy house and demonic things start to happen. Only this time the demonic presence uses math. Math. Yeah, you heard me right both times. Fucking math. There's like equations for how the room's laid out and you know, the, the square of the room and all these different numbers that they put together and find out that there's something demonic about the way that they, it's very weird, very unique. And while I can give credit for it being different, I've never seen a horror movie try to scare you with math. I don't think that's the best course to take. I mean, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask. I mean, I was a 4.0 student. I graduated high school with a college credit in calculus but I've never found math scary. Number six is going to be Morbius, and I completely forgot that this movie came out this year. It feels like ages since I saw this thing. It felt like ages since it was announced. This was a trailer that I felt like I watched in the theater for like two years. It was one of the most prolific delayed films because of COVID. And with all that extra time to make sure that this was the best movie possible, it felt like they sat around with their thumbs up their asses because this was by a landslide, my least favorite comic book film of the year. And is it the worst thing ever? No. Some people acted like this was like a crime to cinema or something. It's not on that level. It's just extremely generic and disappointing and forgettable. For Spider-Man Far From Home coming out and just you know, shattering records and everybody for the most part loving it, at least most people loving it, big crowd pleasing movie to follow that up with this and say that this is the universe we're building out for this character for when he eventually comes home to Sony did not put anybody in their good graces. I mean, as is, the two Venom movies have not been, you know, knockout punches. They've made a lot of money, but they've been mixed reception so far. And so to follow that up with the very next character who's gonna build out this villain universe as Morbius the Living Vampire, a character that not too many people outside of Spider-Man comic fans even know who that character is, to have a whole movie f surrounding him that just turns into this very generic, like, late 90s, early 2000s styled comic book film is very puzzling. And it just makes everybody, including me, who has always been on their side, question Sony and question whether or not they can handle having Tom Holland Spider-Man back without the help of Marvel. You have a character that's a vampire. I hate when those movies turn into PG-13 movies. I understand they kind of had to because it has to fit with Spider-Man, but whatever. When you have vampires and PG-13 violence, I think it automatically neuters your movie. So you got that handicap already built in. And the story they decided to tell here just was not very interesting. The villain was extremely generic and forgettable. You have so many different hands on the cookie jar and different cuts of this movie and things that they were reshooting and taking back out and things that were in the trailers that never made it into the movie like all the spider-man universe stuff was essentially ripped out of the film you've got tyrese and his partner as like these fbi investigators or some shit their placement in the movie makes no sense felt like their entire arc was cut out and it all just ends up being 90 minutes of watching jared leto fly around in cgi purple colors and that's not very interesting. You know, we have evolved in the comic book movie genre. You know, these are movies that have, for the most part, grown to be respected in this industry, unless you're Martin Scorsese or somebody from that era of directing. And to 
release a movie like this that would be forgettable in 2001, not a good step in a good direction. And it leaves off with two of the absolute worst post credit scenes I've ever seen in my life. Everything that they tease, I do not want to see, I am not interested in, and it makes zero logical sense. Speaking of generic vampires, number five is The Invitation. This was a movie that was not on my radar, kind of popped up out of nowhere, started to see the trailer here and there. And it's one of those movies where the trailer is essentially the entire film within two minutes. So fuck you marketing, by the way. Uh, this is a film that is a classic gothic romance movie that turns into a Dracula's Brides film in the last 20 minutes. And I didn't find that to be a spoiler when I initially reviewed it. I don't find it to be a spoiler now because the fucking trailer shows you. It shows vampires. It shows everything from the third act. It even shows the moment that the twist is revealed. The plot changes. <sighs> will I ever learn? But even if I didn't know that it was vampires, which is the only reason I went to see this, so it kind of creates a bit of a paradox. I wouldn't have been in the theater in the first place. It's a fairly run-of-the-mill, generic, gothic romance film between this chick from America that goes trying to find her family and the patriarch of this family who's this charming British guy. And so you get some romance stuff with a little bit of creepy imagery in there. I thought that the castle setting was awesome. I will say that. But as soon as it starts to get into the vampire stuff, not even just because the trailer gave it away, it's so run of the mill, cookie cutter, generic reveals. It just does nothing new with it. Nothing new with the Dracula's Bride stuff, nothing new with vampirism. There's no gore or cool, cool kills or blood or anything like that to satisfy us horror fans. It just turns into vampire stuff that's in the same fashion that we've seen a dozen fucking times over the past 20, 30 years. And it ends on a serious whimper because it feels like the main character just dispatches of this situation so easily. And then that leads into this, you know, tease of things to come. That's like, uh, no, no, thanks. And so by the end of it, it was extremely disappointing for somebody that has been, no pun intended, thirsty as fuck for vampire films to make a comeback. Ever since Twilight, we have not had vampire horror films for somebody that wanted that to be this movie, the movie to kick the doors back open for that. I was extremely disappointed in how generic and vanilla this thing was. Number four is going to be Pray for the Devil. Now, this thing was red flags all over the place. I'm not the biggest fan of possession, demon type movies, exorcism movies. I think that the vast majority of them are very reminiscent of each other. I mean, I don't even have The Exorcist in a list of my favorite horror films of all time, if that tells you anything. So, I knew this probably was not going to be the movie for me, but I went to go check it out because I try to give these movies a chance. Same with Imitation. You know, I was like, okay, we'll see. Go to see it, and it's exactly the movie that I could have watched the trailer, and I could have written out the plot of the rest of this movie and been 90% spot on because it is so much like all the other films that we have gotten in this subgenre that it's just boring. I mean, you have the Catholic Church, you have the main character who's a nun, and the Catholic Church has this little prison style hospital thing where they're taking people that are you know known to be possessed by demons and they're trying to almost like build out this task force of exorcism trained nuns and priests and everything and so there's a somewhat interesting change in the setup but all of the execution is exactly like any other movie you could think of to down to the scares down to the actual body like changing the the, the demon possession stuff we're going to crack around we're going to bend things backwards we're going to walk up the walls i mean we've seen that dozens of times since the 70s and so by the end of it the only thing that kept me interested in this movie was that there's a little bit of the main character that's held back and just revealed slowly throughout the movie but about a third of the way in it becomes extremely obvious what reveal they're holding back and when you get to it it's like well no shit that's the only card you had left to play so if you're a big fan of the demon possession exorcism subgenre if you like a lot of the movies of that subgenre even if they are reminiscent of each other this is totally for you as somebody that that is not one of my favorites this was not for me and now we're at my top three and woo, these three were doozies for very different reasons number three for me is going to be dash cam and talk about red flags before you walk into a movie first of all blumhouse blumhouse get some quality control guys because you're one of the best studios out there when you're on and you're one of the worst studios out there when you're off inevitably every single year i have at least one film in my top of the year that's a blumhouse film and i have like two that are in my worst of the year so i never know what to get from them then you have the found footage aspect which that's possibly my least favorite subgenre of horror 
And so I turned this movie on again, try to give it a chance, maybe I'll be surprised. And within minutes, I realized I had made a mistake because the main character of this film is one of the most insufferable people I have ever spent 90 minutes with in my entire life as a film fan. You essentially have this character that is created to be the most stereotypical, cookie cutter, obnoxious version of like a blood red conservative anti-mask and Trump fan, like anything that you could think of that's like the most extreme example of that. It's all of those in one character. And you spend every single moment of screen time with this character because it's found footage. That in and of itself sounds like a, a fucking corkscrew getting shoved into my ass. And that's exactly what this movie was basically like. And so the found footage style stuff is the same as you've seen where the first hour there's not a whole lot going on there's a lot of shaky cam there's a lot of why are we still recording and then you get into some of the reveals in the last act and to their credit there's some decent in-camera effects there's some decent um physical effects practical effects that are that are given here that look very effective in the found footage format but there's nothing in a narrative stance that is revealed or that we explore that is anything different or unique or cool that we have not seen done better and done differently in other found footage movies. And so even if the main character was tolerable, I would classify this as one of the most forgettable movies of the year. But because of that main character, it was one of the most agonizing experiences I've ever had. And then it made it even worse whenever after I was done watching this, I did a little bit of research on the movie before I reviewed it. And apparently the woman that is playing the main character is actually a social media influencer who is exactly or pretty damn close to the character that she is portraying. Now, I'm somebody on a political stance. I don't take either side. I think there's things over here that make sense. I think that there's things over here that make sense. I like listening to everybody. And I, for the most part, think that if you're hard on either direction, you're a bit fucking nutty. And so when I watch that and I think a filmmaker in a studio went out to convince this woman that has this social media controversial presence where a lot of people hate her and they wanted her to take that and amplify it and play herself in a movie to make even more people after they see the film hate her. That just seems scummy to me. <laughs> like it just something so distasteful about that that just I don't understand what they were going for. I don't understand what they were trying to accomplish with that. And so from top to bottom, left to right, the movie is just a gigantic turnoff to me. And now we're at my top two, and I gotta be honest, they might as well be tied because they're both equally offensive to me, but when I saw my number two, I said there's no way a movie's gonna be worse than that this year. And unfortunately, I did see one, and you'll know when I get there why. My number two is Jeepers Creepers Reborn. I'm somebody who adores the original Jeepers Creepers movie. And I have some decent fun with the second one. I thought the third one was an absolute train wreck. Yes, I understand a lot of you do not like this franchise, do not like the first film, even if you objectively know that it's a good horror film because of the, the director. I totally get all of that. I can't separate my love of that first film, or, or I can separate my love of that first film with the reality of the director. I loved it for over a decade before I even knew that that happened. So Jeepers Creepers Reborn. When I heard that they were going to reboot it, and Victor Salva was no longer involved and it was a whole new crew and they were going to go back and you know go back to basic I was like oh my god please please make up for the god awful movie that was Jeepers Creepers 3 had all the faith in the world in it then as we got closer to the movie being released you saw the first trailer and it was like this really low budget generic haunted house movie and I was like that doesn't look like Jeepers Creepers that looks like Leprechaun Origins what the fuck are you doing then there was this stuff coming out about the movie being sued because maybe or maybe they did not have the legal right to make this film. I don't know. There was a weirdness with that. Then it turned out it was just going to be a limited release Fathom event in one or two nights and not an actual release. Every red flag possible again. And so the closer to the release I got, the more and more I became of the mindset that this was probably going to be horrible. And so I walked in with that mentality, lower than low expectations. And this movie still shocked me at how bad that it was to the point where, and I never do this. I came home, did my review and pleaded with everybody. This movie does not deserve a dime. Like it is so bad. It is so low quality, so low effort to the point where it had to be on purpose. There had to be somebody in the production crew that wanted this thing to be so horrible so that this franchise tied to Victor Salva never saw the light of day again. That is the only way that I can make any logical sense out of how awful this thing turned out to be. There is no fucking way on earth that that happened accidentally. 
because everything in this movie is bad. The writing is terrible, the story is terrible, the acting is bad. It doesn't have anything in common with the other Jeepers Creepers movies. It breaks the established lore of the franchise. I don't think there was a single fucking background in any single individual scene in this movie that was an actual physical background. I think it was all green screen. I wouldn't be surprised if they filmed this entire fucking movie in a little studio lot with a green or a blue screen behind them in every single scene because all throughout this movie you're looking and you're like, why are they lit so weird? Why do they have that glow around them where they're being keyed out? Like even just an outdoor cemetery. You couldn't find a fucking cemetery to film in? It's just baffling stuff, just basic filmmaking stuff that you look at and you go, why does this movie look the way that it looks? Then you see the creeper and from the moment that he's revealed, you're like, what the fuck is that thing? And all throughout the film, it looks and acts less and less and less like a Jeepers Creepers film and turns into this generic low budget monster haunted house film to where it has nothing in common with what actual fans of this franchise go to these movies for of which that is the only people left that you're trying to appeal to you're not going to gain jeepers creepers fans in the fourth fucking film after years of controversy it's not going to happen us we're the only ones left appeal to us and they basically said we don't care down to the point where the way that they actually wrap this movie up and dispatch of the creeper is so highly against the lore of this franchise that it was maddening for me to where they, it happens and I'm like, that is not how you defeat the Creeper. Otherwise, he would have been defeated in the previous three fucking movies the same exact way. That makes no sense. That's lazy. That's bullshit. And fuck you for doing it. And then you get past that and there's this new crow power that he's never had that makes no sense. That has no explanation. The chick has black eyes. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? And she turned into a Creeper. I don't know. I don't care. I don't want to follow up to this. I don't want to hear about this franchise ever again. I'm just going to have my original movie. I'm going to hold it close to my heart, pretend it was directed by somebody else and love it forever. And all the other movies in this franchise, I'm just going to pretend never existed because this is a movie that is so bad, so offensive, that I never want to hear its name again. It, it literally does not deserve more than $2, which it made more than that just with my ticket alone. So it, it, like I said, it's one of those very few times. Usually I tell everybody, make up your own mind, check it out, maybe you'll like it. No, find a free copy of it, find out that your neighbor has it and fucking watch it through a pair of binoculars. Do anything that you have to do if you have to see this movie to not give it any more money because I swear to God, if they green light a sequel and I find out it's the same crew, I'm gonna have a fucking heart attack. But don't make that a reality. Don't make that the world that we live in. So what movie could have possibly been worse than that? Well, unfortunately, my number one is a movie that I had not heard of before, was not on my radar, and I only found out I was watching it a couple of days before I watched it at Fantastic Fest with my buddy Uncle Sean. And that is Birdemic 3, Sea Eagle. If you have never heard of the Birdemic franchise before, I apologize for changing that. I had never heard of it before until I arrived at this festival and essentially we were looking over the movies for the different days and he was like, I don't care what we see, but this day, on this day, we have to watch this one because me and my friend watched Birdemic 1 and 2 in preparation for this and we're closing it out with this one, so that's the only must. And I'm like, okay, I've never heard of the first two. Do I need to watch them beforehand? And he said, no. And I'm glad I listened. <laughs> Birdemic is essentially one of those movies that belongs in conversation with The Room and Troll 2 and Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2. Movies that are so unbelievably bad that they kind of loop back around again and get a reputation and a fandom for being hilariously terrible. And the guy that made that is like an environmental activist. And so it's like a post-apocalyptic disaster movie that is made by somebody who, I apologize for the term, but is incompetent at making films. And so the result is something that you either absolutely despise or you love it for how terrible that it is. And he did that two more times. So I saw Birdemic 3 and a from what I have been told, it's exactly the same plot, same beats, same exact style, same mistakes, same incompetence as the first two films, just repeated again. Even just on a basic filmmaking level, like the, the dead spots after dialogue scenes, they don't cut. And so there's like three seconds of dead air that you're just focusing on these characters going, 
Why are we still watching them? The scene's over. Cut to something else. Like even just something on that very small, basic, elementary level of filmmaking is done incompetently here. And then during the last 30 minutes of the movie, absolutely out of nowhere, suddenly clip art images of birds show up on screen and the same exact basic like Windows 95 sound clip of a bird is just played over and over. When these fucking birds come into screen and then they start like dive bombing into things and blowing shit up. Like I could do a better job here at home. And I don't mean that to be arrogant. I don't mean that to be up my own ass. That is a fact. I could make a better Birdemic scene here at home with this camera and this green screen behind me and Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects than a fully funded fucking movie that was at a film festival. And so then it's 30 minutes of that. And then gun stuff where somebody's like, literally doing that. I'm not exaggerating, just holding a gun. And they put little clip art like sparks. Pow, pow, pow. Pow, 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 pow. For 30 minutes straight. The movie did not loop all the way back around to being hilarious and me enjoying it and just laughing my ass off. It stopped about here. And so it was just agonizing to watch. I mean, when I walked in and the filmmakers and the crew are passing out shots of, of tequila to everybody to prime them for the screening, I should have known then that I was fucked. And so while Jeepers Creepers 2, or excuse me, Jeepers Creepers Reborn was unbelievably shockingly bad, offensively bad, at least there's a version of that movie that I could find myself watching again and just roasting it. Birdemic 3 was just like, how does this exist? How does this exist once? let alone the same guy being funded to make it two more times exactly the same way and not making any effort to improve whatsoever. Like, okay, you accidentally made a disaster piece. You have this big reputation. You have this fandom and this notoriety for making that movie. Cool. Why would you do that two more times? And you're watching the Q&A after the, the screening where the filmmaker gets up there and the actors get up there and everybody's taking it dead serious. Like, hey, why did you want to work with this guy and make this movie? Oh, well, you know, just I'm a huge fan of John here and I just I really wanted to work with this filmmaker. You know, just one of those things that I wanted to do in my career. What the fuck are you talking about? This is not the movie to be answering the questions that way. Hey, why'd you want to make this movie? You see how fucking hilariously bad that first one was? Man, I had to have my name attached to that. I'm going to be YouTube famous after this. <sighs> so unfortunately, my number one worst film of the year is Birdemic 3, Sea Eagle. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, please click this playlist over here for all of the movies in 2022 that I watched and reviewed. I'm also going to put a playlist up here of all of these end of the year wrap up videos. You won't see one when this first one drops, but as I get more of them, there will be a playlist up here to check out. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the rest of those videos and all the goodies I have planned for 2023. Thank you, as always, for watching. And remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.